Hi, my name is Josh Sweeney. And I'm Crystal Sweeney. And welcome to the Company Culture Check video series. Today we're here at Paystake to learn about their amazing company culture. Let's go. Let's go. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Good to be here. So, we're here at Paystake with Jeremy and you're a co-founder, correct? Yes. Awesome, tell us a little bit about the company culture at Payscape. My name's Jeremy Wynn, uh, I'm co-founder of Payscape. Payscape is a fintech company based in Atlanta, Georgia. We really, uh, our roots of our, our business are starting out as a sales and marketing engine for fintech uh, related products. So uh, we started the business almost 15 years ago um, before fintech was even really a word, I think. Um, and I'm not sure that fintech is a word today <laughs> even still. Um, but when we started the business, um, it was, and I, I showed you guys as you walked in a picture of the basement of my house, um, you don't have a whole lot to go on when you're starting a business. So an idea and a vision and, uh, and you better sell the dream. Um, and so part of that selling the dream is creating a culture um, and call it a sixth sense or whatever it was that was in my, in my DNA at the time. But I was like, I don't have money to pay people so I better make it a cool place to work and have fun and bring 100% of yourself to work. So. That's been critical since day one, and here we are 15 years later, it's still, uh, you know, it's one of the most important things is to be able to bring 100% of yourself to work, which when you have a group of people in under one roof and everybody's bringing 100% of themselves to work, creates a unique and, and cool culture. So uh, we've got every, every walk of life, and we talk about millennials, we talk about Generation X, we talk about whatever the next generation is below that. Um, and I, I think that everybody is, is looked at, or the, the, way that, the way that I look at them, and hopefully I think the rest of the company does, is that everybody is, is, is a person. You know? they, they're, not, they're not labeled by you know, wherever they come from, or Generation X, or whatever the, whatever the case might be. Um, so that all, all provides some really cool opportunities to, to leverage people's backgrounds and people's, uh, and people's passions. Um, and then we, we bring it all together. Um, it's almost like a, like a Seinfeld setup kind of thing. You know, like when you, when you bring that whole group of people together on a Seinfeld episode, like look what happens. Just cool, crazy stuff happens all the time. Ideas flow, cool things happen. Um, but you can't necessarily figure out which one of those people, if you took one out, it ruins the whole kind of uh, the show. You're like, that doesn't exist without Kramer, right? Or, right? or George, which one you can't, like you can't do it without one of them. So the, the totality and the sum of all of our people is greater than the individual parts. And, and uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. So, you know, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, a way, one way to kind of phrase what we do here, what we, you know, what our culture is, and the easiest way to say is work hard, play hard. Um, but it's so, it's so much more than that. Um, and, and everything we do, you know, we think about it in three folds, kind of like, you know, what, how it affects our clients, how it affects our culture, how it affects our, you know, our bottom line. So all of those things have to be taken into consideration when we make decisions. So as part of that, you talked about starting off early on in your basement and building a culture and really having to have an amazing place to work because you didn't have any money to pay people, yep. right? And how has that evolved over time? Now you're in an awesome building, you have you know, all these amazing perks that are built in, mm -hmm. um, Payscape's thriving. So how has the culture evolved over time? Well, I mean, now that you, if you if you can pay people and have a cool culture, that's a double threat. Like you know, that's that's why why would you want to go anywhere else, right? That's right. Um, and you know, we, we talk about this. In fact, we had a strategy meeting this week where we spoke about how you know the, the workforce is changing, the economy is booming. Um, do we need to pay people more? You know, and and just a, almost the the my takeaway was like people were just saying we need to pay people more to pay people more almost like yeah. you know we're not getting the same level of talent. There's a threat that we might be not be able to get the same level of talent and all these things. And, that's just not the case. We spoke about Chick Fil A, which you know is a you know, they've got the the gold star of approval for a lot of different things, and and they're known for their culture um, and not necessarily paying them. The people will work there because of the culture and the things that they provide versus getting paid more. We're not nearly the size of Chick Fil A, but you know I, yeah. I think that it's it's a to answer your question on how it's evolved over the years. You know the roots of it are the same. You know provide a great culture. Culture will will trump. All strategies, it'll trump you know everything at the end of the day. So keep our finger on the pulse of that, and um, and it's it's important as you try to scale the business that you you've got you know it certainly stems from the top down, but it could be messed up in the middle very easily. Yeah. So you mentioned the whole work hard, play hard. I I had the chance to work at an organization that was I considered work hard, play hard. We we hit deadlines, we stayed late, we did whatever was needed for certain marketing pushes or software pushes. But then after that, we went out and we played hard. Mm -hmm. So how do you 
how do you balance that? How do you make that work hard mentality happen while keeping a good culture? Because some people can say, well, uh, we just do a lot of work hard and we stay late nights and we don't feel rewarded. Some people have, you know, really feel the ethos of work hard, play hard. How do you manage that balance? T-shirts. You got T-shirts. <laughs> T-shirts. Uh, we, uh, there's, a, there's a phrase that kind of rings throughout the company. My dad actually used to say it to me when I was a kid. I think other people have like, you know, at this point, I don't know who's taking credit for it at this point, but it's, uh, it flies around. You're, you but, are. Uh, now I am, yeah, it's official. Uh, or my, my father. Um, so it's, uh, if you want to hoot the owls, you got to wake up and soar with the eagles. Okay. And so that, that is part of the, uh, you know, part of the thing. We, we'll go out and have a great time, but you better get up in the morning and get back at it. And, you know, every right. day is a new day. Um, so there, but to answer your question also as to how you balance that work hard, play hard, it is a, uh, it's, it's a delicate balance because a lot of people necessarily you can't, can't handle both ends of the spectrum, but sometimes they're not made for a pay scape then. Yeah. Gotcha. So let's switch over a little bit to hiring because to have an amazing culture, you still, you have to get people in the door. Yep. Right. So from a hiring perspective. What are what is Payscape doing to hire people that match their company culture? What are they going through on the front end that ensures that they're a good fit? Yeah, I mean, there's some, some very basic things. Our internal referral program is something that we've continued to work on over the years. Um, our best employees and people that, that are that are Payscapers um, have come from other referrals, uh, people that work here. Yeah. So we've got brothers and siblings. You know, we have siblings, we've got my brother works here, we've got all kinds of different kind of six degrees of separation. Um, and I, I would say almost everybody out of the couple hundred employees we have now fall into that category. Um, okay. It's just, it's textbook, you know, from, from that perspective. And then when you when you look at, you know, we, we, we tap into schools, we tap into, there's some great sales, and or, sales organization uh, uh, curriculums that Kennesaw State has a sales degree that we're okay. working on tapping into that and really kind of fishing where the fish are. So you go go to find somebody that is, is interested in getting into sales right out of the gate, not somebody that wants to get into sales. I mean, not somebody that is, think, thinks they could potentially learn how to be a good salesperson. These people went to school to become salespeople. So sure. we uh, will we'll hopefully uh, attract them out of that pool. Yeah, that's a great avenue. What have you seen, or what has been the biggest challenge in building the culture that you would like to see here and have here? The biggest challenge, uh, you know, at any point is that just the culture is fragile, um, you know, and so it just takes one person that could, you know, slip through the cracks as far as a hire, and you, they could screw up. They maybe they're just a, you know, they're they're just over a division, but that division is call it payroll. <laughs> um, yeah. Payroll that has a bad culture within there, then it's going to trickle out into the rest of the organization, and and salespeople aren't going to be happy if they're not getting you know paid on time or when they have to deal with something. They're going to have to go to you know their their commissions off. They've got to call payroll, and payroll's got a grumpy person on the phone there. Then that just could you know it's 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 a cancer. So that's you know that, that is my biggest uh, fear and challenge. Yeah. So that one, one mishire, that one toxic team member that yeah. just kind of messes it all. Uh, yeah, got it. Okay. And we, we talk about you know failing fast, and, and people are giving people second chances, and we do, we do that a lot. But you also have to, uh, you've got to recognize, and, and that in is tough to coach and teach people about. Yeah. So once you get them in the onboarding experience, what what does that look like? You know, what's what is how does company culture play into the onboarding experience and the feeling that people get when they start their first day at Payscape? Frankly, we've misfired on, on that a couple times, you know. So I think that onboarding is, is so critical that you, they, day one, that person needs to come in and they're fired up, ready to run through a brick wall, uh, and and then kind of you know if, if it's a little bit of a want wah situation, then you, you've you've missed the mark there. But if you can get them on board and fi continue that momentum, you're going to have you know exponentially better results. So um, we work on it from everything from from. A marketing program that has you know when they get into their, their first day on their you know at their desk they've got their t-shirts and their computer set up and all those their business cards that's an interesting one that everybody um, has a uh, has a tendency to to, uh, the, to sit and wait until their business cards are ready which I was shocked by you know I didn't they were like well I'm just gonna wait till so we did we realized that years ago now we know that when people start the first day their business cards are there and ready for them to go and that gets okay. particularly in sales you know that gives them that, that that level of confidence that they need to get out there and uh, and start passing them out so um, we're, we, we do ongoing things or mentoring programs and other cultural things that will get people to join our culture club or do certain things that are going to kind of get them you know, onto the softball team and make sure that they're part of the, the family per se. And is there a certain department that you've mostly focused on over time? Me or personally? Or kind of tailored to like because of your background or anything like that? 
I mean, I, I, I love sales and marketing. That's okay. my DNA. You know, so operations bores me. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, so framing the, all of those things, me personally, that's what, that's where I, I like to, to spend my time in my natural natural happy places in those world. And that, fortunately, but you, if we if we apply the sales and marketing to things that are operational, um, it makes those things that are usually you know clogs in a wheel. It makes them cool too. What do you think is like a unique? Sub element or kind of subculture of the sales team that that you've seen. So if you look at you look at company culture and there's an overarching mission, vision, values, and the types of people you want at the highest level, no matter who you hire across every department. Um, when you look at sales and marketing, what do you feel has been unique about building an, an epic sales culture? What's different there? I'd almost flip that around, okay. and I'd say that what we what we do here is that we turn operations people into sales marketing people. Okay. So we've got it's it's interesting to see we've got developers that are that are here that don't have a sales bone in their body, but after you know a couple of months here, all of a sudden they're saying and doing things and sending referrals over to salespeople, and and that's we've done that consciously too because we are I'm firmly believe every company is a sales company actually. So from and everybody in an organization, no matter what your role is. Is selling that company so they're representing the company and they, they better do it in a good way so from the first time you walk in the door first person you see there to the guy that's the developer that's that's punching keys in a back room somewhere they all are representing the company they should be they should be representing in a, in a you know, world-class manner would you mind sharing how you you know inject some of that into say a development role you know some role that's not forward-facing generally how do you how do you inject that sales culture and sales mentality uh, into those types of roles well, I mean, I th part of it is the is the interaction between groups. Um, okay. You know, and as you walk through our office, you'll see there's not, not a whole lot of walls. Um, and so when I said that guy's punching keys in the back room, he's actually really sitting very close to a group of salespeople. Okay. <laughs> um, and so those things are that's by design. Um, and then you know we do some incentives, things like that, every once in a while to to get people to recognize what a sales opportunity is, so that that developer might be use a vendor that is you know could potentially become a client of ours. And so we need to they would never see that unless you actually kind of coach them up and, and re make them recognize that hey we're actually paying that client every month. You know who wonder who their payment processor is. Right. So little little things like that you know. But but ultimately it's that uh, it's that the the interaction between all the groups. Okay. And you have multiple offices, right? We do. Okay, how yeah. many? Uh, we we fluctuate over the years. We've got about average about 10, 10 remote sales offices. Okay, so how do you maintain, you know, there's people all over the place, and I know in other organizations I've been in, uh, you know, the headquarters felt like it got the most love in a lot of ways, and the mm -hmm. events happened there, and then remote people, you know, could feel left out. How do you maintain company culture across all of these? People love being on groups? islands, just as long as it's not an <laughs> island of an office, right? Right. So, um, that's we, we know that we recognize that and so we do a lot of things um, we have regular ongoing calls we have all kinds of we bring people in on, an, on a regular basis in the corporate we actually go out to offices and host meetings at that remote offices so we'll take people from corporate office out there we make sure that there's we call it the milk route of visit office visits so we have people there almost every week somebody's at, at an office type of thing um, and we also make sure to recognize them just as much as they're being recognized so our Payscape points programs our, our mentoring programs all of those things we, we market back via social media via uh, internal you know internal we Salesforce chatter quite a bit mm -hmm. um, all those things are we, we're making sure to get those names and faces of people that are in these other offices out there just as much if not more than than corporate because it, it is right you, you go to a it, they, there is there are more resources here there just frankly are so yeah. we, we try to make sure that we, we distribute and, and delegate those out as much as possible got it yeah I like the concept of the milk route making sure you're yeah. going out on your route and yeah. hitting yeah. every office and you know, yeah seeing least to <laughs> right, right good places to good visit places hang out right. you know got it That's um, we, we love St. Louis this time of year what else have I not asked you about that you think is in, you know important or uh, different or unique about Payscape's company culture um, you know, I think that it's uh, we've covered a lot of ground as far as Payscape's unique culture, um, and it's it's one that, again, I mentioned it is fragile. It is it is by design in a lot mm -hmm. of cases, um, but it also is was the foundation of the company. So it's one that uh, it's one that continues to evolve, and it, it, it's uh, it's 
interesting to see how you know the perception of benefits things like that are, are not necessarily what they were years ago so the 401k matches all of those things we provide all of those but there's really um, it's it doesn't it you know, the perceived value and the actual value there's yeah. a there's, it's, there's a disconnect on that um, and so it's things that I, I I'm actually shocked I'm not a dog person <laughs> but our company is a very very dog friendly uh, business and company and that probably out of everything is one of the things that that, uh, that get, gives us the most uh, the most street cred conversational people I, I know for a fact we have people here that work here just because they could uh, bring their dog to work and I also know for a fact that people have gotten dogs just because they work here <laughs> oh, wow. so we've had to do a little bit of a balance on on, uh, on you know we have a dog father so the dog father has some rules around dogs now because <laughs> the dogs are outnumbering the people at a certain point so all of those are uh, that, that's probably one thing that we didn't uh, we didn't touch that's a, an interesting kind of uh, Gotcha. Component here. You have to plan and strategize for the dogs. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and for that matter, I mean, I think, this, I think that's a cool, you know, in its own fa the fact that you could make rules up, and the rules are just that that they're just that. Or you could say the dog father says, and the dog <laughs> father that looked at that's looked at as and perceived as you know cool. Or you could you know you could be the person that's you know, just making another rule. Or if it's a policy book, it, you, you got yeah, it. You policy got it. driven, yeah. and it's yes. kind of wah wah. Yes. But the dog yeah. father. You got it. Yeah, that's a lot cooler way to present it for sure. Right, and we do all, on a regular basis. It's how we have to we think through things constantly like that. Like yeah. you know, let's just not make a you know like a policy book. I don't even know what that gives me like it makes me <laughs> nauseous policy books, you know. So, but as you scale a business, you have to have policies and things. But we try to be as cool as we can about that. Right. Yeah, I love it. I love the branding around these different things: dog father, milk routes, you yeah. know, yeah, pay skate, pay skate pay points, it, yeah. all those types of things. So you kind of alluded to the perceived value of the benefits like 401k matching health, all of those things are pretty much table stakes at this point, right? Every, almost every business has to have them to even get talent in the door. If you had to make a prediction, what do you think the next thing is that will just be an absolute requirement for people to compete for talent? Some sort of flexibility around work schedule, schedules, um, you know, remote working, things mm -hmm. like that. You know, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in that we're not enough. You know, jobs aren't nine to five jobs anymore. You know, mm -hmm. you get paid to get something taken care of, and and whether you're taking care of that, you know, sitting between these four walls, or whether you're sitting in your car, or whether you're driving, you know, in your in Piedmont Park doing it, you know, I think that, that you've got to provide that flexibility, um, and and we we do a pretty good job of that. Um, certainly, there are things that you have to have people answering phones. They need to be by the phone, but but with technology now, that phone can very easily be in your hand, and you could be sitting on a beach or an island somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. As long as you're meeting the results, working hard, so you can play yeah. hard later. Yeah, you got it. So I Love think it. that I think that's probably the uh, one of the, the bigger trends that it's already taking place, but yeah. that'll be that'll continue to evolve. Um, and then probably right as everybody has the open work uh, work environments, that's when uh, the walls will go up again. So everything's cyclical, right? Yeah, right. So everything's right. gonna like you know it's like these bell bottom jeans, right? They yeah. came back for a while, now they're gone. Yeah, but the rule of thumb <laughs> is if you did it the first time, you shouldn't be doing it the second time. Oh, is that how it works? Yeah. <laughs> got it. Yeah, <laughs> I like that rule. Anything else I didn't cover? No. What other, what other things are you seeing in the market? Um, as far as like perks and benefits and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we're seeing a lot. You know, it seems like technology companies are really driving it because there's such a high comp uh, competitiveness and competition for certain talent, um, and it's trickling down from there. As far as um, you know, the time off, the flexible work environment is definitely a big one. I think just having an office atmosphere where people have the ability to collaborate inside and outside of the office is a big one. Mm -hmm. So we're hearing we're hearing a lot more people that do quarterly events, monthly events, anything where they get outside the office and build those bonds. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's instrumental, right? Because you're not going. It's not um, industrial age where we're going from nine to five and we leave work and we're checked out. And we don't have a phone, like you said. You yeah. know, you can work from anywhere. So people want to build bonds, and that's what also helps in the retention. If they if they have a relationship with their coworkers, it's a little bit harder to leave, mm -hmm. and it's also a little bit better or a lot better while you're at work because you've built a solid relationship. You're not just showing up, working, and leaving every day. So I think those outside events are becoming uh, pretty standard across the board. Yeah. Um, definitely in the technology space, other ones are other industries and verticals and, and groups are catching on to that. And there's an art to that too. So outside yeah. events and the fact that we we have them all the time, but very few times are they like you know where it's company sponsored type of like forced family fun I call it. Right. Uh, the more you do that, the less people are apt to like to want to participate. But if you let people come up with it on their own, 
a la our culture club, um, and they have something that everybody kind of feels like it's 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 not necessarily like you know. I gotta go just to show my face type of thing. The company right. Christmas, oh, it's the holiday party. Like, you know, those, those are so many stereotypes on all those things that ring true, actually. So the more you actually, you know, let people, again, be 100% of themselves and bring 100% of themselves to whether it's the event or, or the office, then those bonds all are created. And we've had, we've had actually, I don't know, maybe two or three weddings, probably, wow, out okay. of you know, couples that are uh, that are that have uh, met here, and yeah. which is cool. Like I, I don't, I know that's a a lot of companies would, you know, they've got policies against that too. Um, yeah. It could go south, but you know, <laughs> I think the risk is worth the reward in in, in, in many cases, right. and so that's that's been cool to see. Um, so it's more, um, it's kind of that promoting self organization. Yeah. Outside of the work. Yeah. Right? So you don't have to force it. You don't have to make people feel like they show up. You really just promote it. And foster it and kind of prop it up so that they show can up, pick up the bar tab every once in a while. Yeah, yeah pick up the bar tab. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> people like that. Not all like times. That. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the interesting thing you said, like the weddings and people have these policies around it. And I think you know when you look back where people stayed at jobs five, ten, twenty years, that had a big impact because you know something happens in the relationship, it causes some sort of rift. Mm -hmm. And then they're losing one or two employees that would be long-term employees. Yeah. And I think with the with the amount of jobs people have nowadays and just the turnover, you know, maybe it's not that big of an impact. You know, maybe it's just not that big of a risk anymore. You're not, uh, you know that the, if you know the average 10 years, five years, no matter how great it is, you know, how great a company is to work for, mm -hmm. um, then it's gonna obviously have less of a long-term impact if, if something goes wrong there. That's right. Yeah, and again, going from a reward perspective, there's, you know, once a, uh, you know, once you have that dynamic between two people, I mean, it's even, even more right. beneficial for the especially company. when they first get married, right? Yeah, like right. for those first two years, you got great productivity. I'm guessing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I recently learned. I read. Uh, I can't remember where I read it, but the um, the genesis for culture. Uh -huh. um, are you familiar? Do you no. know what it is? Uh, Latin for care. For care. So that all. Interesting. You care about the relationships. You care about yeah. the culture. You care about. So yeah. So that the was that's for culture. So Hi. Alex, yes. tell us what you do here at yeah. Payscape. My name's Alex, I'm Director of Marketing at Payscape. So I've been here about four years and basically been a part of everything from onboarding, a lot of the marketing side of course, helping with our sales operations is a big piece of it. Um, and I, I try to help with the culture piece, a lot of it. I think every department head feels some sort of responsibility with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I've helped with that piece of it a lot as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. um, the space. Yes. Yeah. I walked in mm -hmm. and was just blown away by everything that was going on and some yeah. of the things that I was seeing <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that just seemed like it's like it's such a cool place to work. Mm -hmm. So can you go into a little bit about yeah. some of yeah. the things that you guys have around the office? Definitely. Um, the space is amazing. I was with Payscape when we had a much smaller space that was very homey and very comfortable, but it got really tight really fast when we started really hiring a lot more of our operations staff that we have now. So this space has really been, um, I think a dream of, of our founders to really have this type of area that everyone feels very comfortable in, but is also very professional, very inviting. Um, between the dogs running around, um, the coffee station and the little bar area we have, the lounge area we have, the neon signs to the rooftop patio. I mean, they really did a good job, I think, of considering all the different areas mm -hmm. and then making it so that it's vibrant and fun and energetic. So one of the big things that you'll always notice when you walk around our office is the music playing. So we have speakers positioned all throughout the office that always have some sort of some sort of music on them. Um, I think the sales reps pick what what their mood is that at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always some sort of lively conversation and vibrance when you walk through the office. You feel that. Well, absolutely. Because yeah. I was just looking right here. Yeah. And <laughs> the records. Somebody yeah. loves to read. Yeah. Man. Yeah. And so I this this speaks to me. So yeah. I absolutely. Uh, was I was digging the music playing yep. in the yep. coffee area absolutely uh <laughs> and 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 i mean there was a ping pong table yes. and it was yeah. just a lot of mm -hmm. fun stuff going around yeah. so uh i also wanted to ask you a little bit about mm -hmm. you know we've talked about the environment a little mm -hmm. bit uh the culture here mm -hmm. just walking through the office the yeah. feel of the the office space yeah, yeah. everybody's desk i was noticing signs yeah. that were taped to mm -hmm. you know their spots and yeah. welcome so yeah. it seemed like it was a very welcoming environment it so is, can you yes. tell me a little mm -hmm. bit more about 
what would you find on somebody's desk, like if they were to come in yeah. this day? Yeah, um, I have a pretty, I, what I love about the way we do things at Payscape is we have these two founders who are the entrepreneurs of the company, mm -hmm. and then everyone else inside the company is more of an entrepreneur. So they really foster that whole mentality going into everyday um, work environment, that entrepreneur versus entrepreneur it really trickles down throughout the whole company. So what I've found is as a department head, I'm able to really take ideas and run with that, be experimental, but also be um, very driven to take my department farther and my team further. So whenever you look around the office and you see that culture really trickling through, everyone feels a lot of ownership. And so we have the, the desks that people have, um, everyone will have their own twist on it, their own personality to it. We encourage that a lot. And I think that's very evident when you walk around. Um, and it really is to me that, that entrepreneur role that you're encouraging everyone to be themselves and to bring their ideas forward and to take something and run with it. So if it's my first day here at Payscape mm -hmm. and I was to walk in, what yep. would I find on my desk? Yeah, so we have um, hats, t-shirts, water bottles, you're going to have your nameplate, business cards. It's really whatever we can raid in the closet and whatever we can bring forth on all of the different desks, we, we do that. So it, yeah. gives, it gives that person a nice warm mm -hmm. welcome like... Right. They belong here exactly. right as they walk yeah. in the door. Uh, we also started doing welcome emails as well. So mm -hmm. everyone will get a welcome email that has a link to their LinkedIn profile, who this person is, um, what they look like. So you know you can say hi to them if you see them in the halls. The more we grow, I think the more you need to put those systems in place so that you're encouraging people to really reach out to each other. Oh, I think that's great because yeah. I think mm -hmm. that starts the mm -hmm. relationship building as soon as they walk right. in. Right, and it's, like, it's personal tidbits as well. Yeah. So that's one of the things we always make sure to find out, you know, what do you do for fun? Mm -hmm. um, binging, binge watching Netflix could be one. Um, going to beer festivals could be one. Uh, hiking with your dog could be one. And it gives you those instant <laughs> talking points for a person. So oh, those awesome. are those are some common ones that I've seen for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so do, are there, you talked about mm -hmm. dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, are there a lot of dogs here? There mm -hmm. are, yes. So Payscape does have um, a dog friendly office and we have anywhere, I would say from two to three dogs in the office at a time. Um, we did have to implement rules at one point because it was almost a doggy daycare in here um, but we do always have some sort of dogs we have a, a side yard that the dogs can use um, everyone is very friendly with dogs it's kind of one of the first questions I even ask going into an interview are you comfortable with dogs it's pretty important when you're hiring Absolutely. someone because they're definitely found around so, here a lot so no dog yeah. allergies right right okay, right no dog allergies. <laughs> that's big okay. I've heard this thing called the culture club yes. and I'm just mm -hmm. dying to hear about what is the culture club yeah. and what is involved in? <laughs> yeah. um, so the culture club at Payscape is essentially going back to that entrepreneur mindset, starting something on your own, having ownership in something. I think as a millennial, that's very important to all of us to have ownership in something mm -hmm. that you want to feel like you're growing it and you're building it and you have some sort of contribution. Culture is the same way. If you don't feed it, it's a living, breathing thing, it dies. Mm -hmm. So you have to have enough people having ownership in something to keep it growing and to keep feeding it. So the culture club is essentially a group of people that care about the culture at Payscape and everyone will get together. We will go through upcoming events, fun things that we want to do as a company, uh, whether it's our holiday party or our Halloween party, or even planning a paintball outing or a Braves outing and taking the fur bus to a Braves game. Uh, we've done it all. And so having that group of people that's invested in it, especially from every department, you want to get every department involved so every department basically sends one representative and that keeps everyone engaged oh that's great yeah. that, mm -hmm. that is a split role and mm -hmm. and you're bringing everybody in together right mm -hmm. so something that i read mm -hmm. yesterday mm -hmm. got me really excited mm -hmm. and i want to hear more about it <laughs> it's pilates and popsicles yes can you tell me a little bit yeah. more about that outing or event that you guys had? Absolutely. So something that we started doing a couple years ago is Wellness Wednesday. So Wellness Wednesday came from, you know, we do a lot of 5Ks. We run Ragnar Relays as a company. Um, we've done the TAG Techie 10K as a company. There's a lot of different events we've done from a wellness perspective. Um, but Wellness Wednesdays were how can we bring it into the office and how can we make it more accessible to more people who might not be a runner. Um, and so we started doing 
Pilates is one that we've done. We've done flywheel classes together, um, smoothie days. We did a salsa day. Um, the Pilates and Popsicles was a really cool one that was recent. Uh, one of the girls that works here, her sister is a Pilates instructor. So we tapped her to come in, teach everyone Pilates. And one of the cool things I know they taught everyone was things you can do at your desk, mm -hmm. which was pretty neat. So we actually had desk chairs <laughs> and practicing different Pilates moves that you can do at your desk and kind of keep you keep your blood flowing a little bit during the work day. So that was a pretty cool one that we've done recently. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Payscape and, mm -hmm. and giving back. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. tell me, what does Payscape do or mm -hmm. what have they done in the past to mm -hmm. give back to yep. the community? Yep. So we started the Payscape Pays It Forward program. That was something that I think it was our founder's brainchild again way back in the day. Um, Payscape points are something we implemented, which is every single office to really keep every other office engaged, give them the opportunity to participate in some local events on, on their local offices as well is really important. So the Payscape Pays It Forward program basically rewards people for charity, wellness, and performance. So performance is basically making, if, if you're an A player, if you hit your goals, you get points for that those are pay skate points mm -hmm. um, the wellness piece of it if you participate in softball league or you participate in a 5k you get points for that mm -hmm. um, and then the charity piece of it is if you um, say you volunteer at a local shelter in your local area or you do any sort of other charity event in your local market you get points for that as well all those points can be cashed in for real prizes mm -hmm. so i cashed in one recently actually at a 500 hundred dollar delta flight credit so that was great so once you hit that point mark you get you get to really cash out in real prizes so that's something that at a corporate level we were able to do and everyone in the whole company is able to take advantage of no matter which market they're located in um, the big one that we do as a headquarters every year is our glow in the green charity event so i'm actually in charge of that one as well so it's it's our giant golf tournament we do every year um, we've raised over a hundred thousand dollars in the past few years for wow. junior achievement julie's dream wounded warrior project we pick a different number of charities that we've supported over the years and that one has been our, our big one each mm -hmm. year that that really takes the effort of the whole company um, we have lots of great sponsors from waffle house um, to you know troutman sanders to Park Mobile, whoever it is that's helping sponsor. Um, food trucks, 300 attendees, live music. It's a really great event and it's all for charity. Nice. So where are you going? The, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> I'm trying to get my husband to take me to Japan. That's my that's my big one. Yeah, if I can convince him to do yes. that, that'll be great. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the building, mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about the inside of the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you drive past the front, yes. what do you see? <laughs> um, so our mural was completed this past spring um, by a local artist named Yo-Yo Farrow. Um, really great artist, has a very clear design style. And our arch over the front of the building uh, he calls it Stargate. That's the that's the technical art term for it. Um, but it is technically now we are a, a landmark in Midtown. It is a huge play for us. Atlanta is Transaction Alley. That's what it's known as in the, the greater financial technology community. So we are now a piece of that, a real living, breathing piece of it in Midtown with the letters across the top and the beautiful mural. Um, I think it sets us apart from your traditional financial services companies that are out there it makes us you know it, it sends that message that we are more young fun tech oriented i love that it's kind of just a staple landmark of the of the midtown scene now that's uh, awesome mm -hmm. so what is your most favorite thing about the culture here at Pace Cape? i think i always just end up going back to my favorite thing about the culture is that entrepreneur mindset um really being able to come on board and own something and grow a team um, come up with new ideas, go to different classes. I think I, in on my budget every year, we build in some sort of continuing education play. So whether it's going to an industry conference, whether it's helping, I mean, last weekend we went to a Instagram uh, class, just me and my team to figure out, you know, what we could be doing better on social. And, you know, no one taught me Instagram in college. I've had to learn that. There is a continuing education piece that should always just be budgeted into any, any company, any department. We have a full-time training staff. We have our Payscape University program. Um, my team has a marketing specific industry, you know, continuing education budget. So I think it is just that mindset that you can come in and really take on any project and really make something happen and kind of see it all the way 
through. And when you have that level of ownership, you care a lot more, you're invested a lot more, you put forth a lot more effort, period. So I, I really just love that whole aspect of how we've built things here. It's not siloed into different departments and you can only do the job description that you were given. It's really sky's the limit. And that's my favorite part by far. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there anything mm -hmm. that I haven't asked you that you would like to share um, about the culture here? We do like monthly trainings mm -hmm. for our outside offices. So if a rep from Nashville or a rep from Cleveland, when they get to come in and see the environment we've built here, I think it really helps them take that back to their local office. So we always like to make sure we're conveying that, that fun vibe for anyone that comes okay, to visit that brings, office. That brings yeah. a good point with there being mm -hmm. uh, so many offices in so many right. different locations. Mm -hmm. Are all of the locations mm -hmm. similar to this location yeah. as far as just the whole feel and right? So, so we've we've had to try a number of different ways to inject the culture of corporate mm -hmm. into the culture of those field offices that we have. Um, when you get up to ten offices and you have all these different managers running things, it gets hard to really make sure that you're conveying that throughout every level of the company. So, something we've done um, more recently with the trend of like co-op spaces and these, you know, running out these amazing. Um, we work and any of the there's a few industrious I know is one so with those co-working spaces we've really been we've really found that it really has the same culture as we almost have here mm -hmm. they're they're vibrant they're bright they're fun they have monthly happy hours they have a cool office vibe some of them allow you to bring dogs so when we're talking about company perks it's like an instant company perk that you can just move into and a manager in a local office doesn't have to worry about setting up a, a coffee bar or having um, making sure the trash is taken out or having really cool signage in the office it's just automatically done for them so with all the new offices we've been opening we really have gone toward that model because it's the same vibe we have here so it's an instant culture almost built around these co-op spaces um, and then we do have a few offices that have um, their own physical space and they all have the same vibe we have as here as well. So murals on the walls, um, all the same signage that we have. We make sure if we print a mission and a value statement poster for our corporate headquarters, those all go to our field offices as well. So they have the same signage, a consistent look and feel and branding across all of our different markets. Have there been any really big spills with the hoverboards? <laughs> There's definitely been some spills with the hoverboards. Um, the recent trend with birds coming to the area is the scooters and having people ride their scooters around the office. I've seen a couple of those. Um, it's it's very it's very much I feel like coming here it's like a playground have you and tried it makes the it really fun. I have not tried the hoverboard. Are you doing <laughs> I'm to? a little terrified of them to be honest. I've done the scooters. I don't know if I could do the hoverboards. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know if I can. Rain, I think, with, yeah, with I don't. I don't know if I can go into the hoverboard. Yeah. <laughs> so, Will, tell us about your role here at Payscape. Cool. Uh, my name is Will Hammonds. I am the head of inside sales here at Payscape. Awesome. So, um, what other sales groups exist at Payscape? You're inside sales. What else is there? Yeah. So, Payscape kind of has a, a three-headed monster when it comes to our sales approach. We've got uh, inside sales, obviously, we have uh, outside sales, and then just recently, we in the last year or so, uh, really built out our biz dev and enterprise uh, sales department. So they're going after software integrations and uh, big referral partnerships with uh, associations and, and organizations like that. Gotcha. So you have enterprise sales, which is kind of more outbound. Inside sales, would you say is generally inbound, or are y'all doing outbound calling? Uh, we we do get some inbound, but it, it's a hunter roll. You know, okay. we are we are out there uh, hitting the phones, trying to talk to as many folks as we can uh, on a daily basis. Uh, provide some value, set up some meetings, and and uh, and close some deals. What's the subculture in each look like? Like, what do you feel that is a little different around inside sales versus enterprise outside, and and the other groups that you have? So obviously. There's, uh, there's a little more autonomy with an outside sales role than an inside sales role. Uh, but I think uh, the, the culture as a whole is pretty constant throughout the same divisions. And a, a big reason for that is, is because the, the sales leader of each division uh, cannot be successful without working with the other teams. So, uh, you know, I've got a great relationship with our VP of enterprise. I've got a great relationship with our, our VP of outside sales. Uh, and when we kind of set the tone from 
uh, a collaboration effort at the top, we see it trickle down uh, as well. Uh, and part of our sales process uh, requires our reps from outside uh, to work with inside, requires our reps from enterprise to work with inside. So uh, a lot of collaboration and, and making sure that, that we, we really make an effort to have genuine relationships where uh, we care about each other's numbers. How do you, so when you talk about caring about each other's numbers, how do you, how do you make that a collaborative event? Are there team numbers plus personal numbers? How do you, how do you drive that collaboration? Because when you think of salespeople, a lot of traditional sales might think of this person has their own quota and they go off and they're supposed to hit that quota. So how do you drive that team feel? In order for all the teams to work towards a common goal, uh, that starts with our C-level leadership. Uh, making sure that there's buy-in from the individual groups. Uh, knowing that, that we have a common goal, whether it's an EBITDA goal or an overall deal count goal, uh, and again, the way that we're structured having to work together, we, we definitely have individual superstars uh, on each team, uh, but we also do a really got, good job hiring and nurturing these superstars to make sure that they're setting an example for the folks around them to be team players. That sounds like a ton of work. So I'm guessing there's some sort of training that goes into place for them and maybe some training that goes into place for you. So what is what is the what is the training and onboarding experience look like for an inside sales rep here? So the training and onboarding experience for an inside sales rep is, is something that we're constantly working on. Uh, it's something we've made a lot of strides with the last uh, year or so. Again, it's a, it's a collaborative effort, uh, not just for myself, but we're making sure that we're working with our director of training, uh, our recruiting team, our marketing team to make sure that they've got all the swag when they come in day one and they feel welcome. Uh, but it's, it's something that's constantly evolving and it's something that, that I re rely on my reps to help with a lot. Uh, during the interview process, I tell any prospective new hires that their biggest resource when they when they come to Payscape is going to be their peers, and so challenging my reps to to always act as a leader, whether it's with someone who's more senior than they are, but especially a, a new hire, uh, has been really valuable uh, as far as our onboarding and, and getting people ramped up. And what about training for yourself? Are you are you delivering the training? Are you taking training? What is what is your growth path look like as uh, the head of inside sales. There's a there's an old Warren Buffett quote: "If you're not learning, you're not earning." Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I try and carve out at least 15, 20 minutes a day just to consume content. And there's so much incredible content out there between podcasts, uh, video series. Uh, I think LinkedIn is an awesome place to consume content. I think if you can follow a, a couple of sales leaders, what their thoughts are are great, but what I've found is there are a lot of really powerful discussions happening in the comments section uh, uh, of these posts from sales leaders across different verticals, across different industries, uh, with different tenures, uh, and sales is, is to me a, a clay pot. And If you don't always have your hands on it, if you're not always molding it, uh, and, and you're kicking the spin wheel, it's going to fall apart. So if you can pull uh, and grab things from, from other folks and try and implement it, there's definitely a lot of A-B testing, right? Uh, but, but content uh, and a lot of self-learning has been very valuable for me. Okay. So, I mean, you got great sales leaders, you know, Jeff, uh, Jeb Blunt, Grant Cardone, you know, you got all these crazy people out there that are producing amazing content. Are there one or two that you've really just taken to that you love and have enjoyed their content? Yeah, I love Jeb Blunt. Okay. Uh, I'm not really a big Grant Cardone okay. guy. I think uh, I think a lot of these guys get into the space and they're just hype machines and, and yeah. they're, they're almost snake oil salesmen. Uh, a couple of guys that I really respect and I think are doing great things in the space are John Barrows and uh, most recently his team, Morgan Ingram. Uh, he runs a, a podcast called uh, the SDR Chronicles. Uh, those would probably be be my top two. Jeb Blunt has a has an incredible podcast, Sales Gravy, that I listen to yeah. a lot. Uh, so right now, that's that's really what I'm I'm digging. So with that, you just mentioned a couple really great salespeople and podcasts that you listen to. Is there anything that you're doing to get out there? Because you're I'm sure you're learning a lot at such an amazing, fast growing company, right? You've been on the Inc. 500 
multiple times and fastest growing, things like that, and I'm sure you're a big part of that. Um, are there things that you're doing to pass along that information as well? Do you have a podcast? Do you do some blogging? What does that look like for you? Uh, I try and, and help with some content with the marketing team. That's actually something I've, I've implemented for our reps. Uh, it's important for us to get as much sales content at, content out there as possible. As far as self-branding, that's something I could definitely be doing better, uh, but I think it's really important to get out and network and meet with a lot of people, and through that, uh, just getting out and introducing yourself and being able to tell your story, you find opportunities, uh, like being able to speak on panels, and that's something I've been really lucky to do uh, a couple times now. That was actually a goal of mine coming into 2018, was to get on my first panel. I was able to get on my first panel then, uh, I got invited to a second, we're about to host uh, a third. Uh, and I think that's that's really powerful, not just from a, a, an ego standpoint, like, but I'm in sales, so I love it, obviously. Like, look at me, like, watch me, listen to me. Uh, but I think it's something that's that's really important for uh, recruiting as well. You know, the, the self-brand carries the Payscape brand with it also. And as, as much as I can get out there and, and hopefully make an impact, then that allows us to to have additional people put their eyes on our brand and our company and think about coming over here and uh, and and being able to contribute to the team. Yeah, I love the idea. It's it's actually a little bit of validation for what I was doing this morning. So I was doing some brainstorming and I had been talking to another entrepreneur yesterday and I said, yeah, in me going out and doing videos and you know being a thought leader, we would like to. My thought was, you know, instead of being that one person, you see the one person in a lot of companies do that, of having other heads of departments and making sure you're hiring a head of a department, whether it's sales or marketing or uh, something else that goes out and becomes a thought leader as well, and then everybody's doing it. And I've, I felt a little bit of validation today talking to you and Jeremy, because now I've heard of two of you being on panels and going out and leading the discussions in your respective fields. Are there other people in Payscape that are yeah. on panels as well? Yeah, absolutely. Team? Our director of marketing, okay. Alex, uh, she's going to be teaching some adjunct courses uh, this year at Agnes Scott, I believe. Okay. Uh, so when she told me that, I, like, that's just really cool. It, it validates that not just what I'm doing, but, but what we're doing as a whole. Because as you mentioned, we have people from different departments being asked to come and speak. And, and that just you know, really validates the brand and what we're doing here at Payscape because it's not one person, it's a, it's a collaborative team effort uh, with, with real leaders uh, that, that people want to listen to. Awesome, I love it. Is there anything else about Inside Sales Team that I haven't asked you or anything about that culture, hiring, onboarding, retention, engagement? Yeah, so when it, when it comes to hiring, I think one thing that we do that's so important that, that maybe some other companies don't do is we bring in a ton of folks to come and talk with you. And it's not like, hey, tell me about your background. It's, hey, tell me about you. You know, I had an interview come in yesterday and I had a new hire go in and interview her. Because when, especially in inside sales, you know, we're not road warriors. We're not out on the street for six, seven hours a day. We're in the office eight to 10 hours a day. And it's important that we like each other and we get along. Uh, and it's kind of an iron sharpens iron uh, situation when you're back there with the same people every day. So uh, we'll bring in people from other departments. We'll bring in my most senior uh, AE. We'll bring in a brand new new hire. Uh, and, and we want to get their stamp of approval that, that this is somebody that I want to sit next to or this is somebody I want to sit, sit across from, mm -hmm. you know, for hopefully five years, right? 10 years, yeah. you know? Uh, and it's really important because uh, as somebody who's married with a family, I'm going to spend more time with my employees than I am with them. Uh, so it's important that I like them, right? Yeah. It's important that, that, that my reps like them. If my reps don't like who they're sitting next to or, or who they're working with, the chance of a trading talent is going to skyrocket. So it's really, really important that they, ha they have a say in, in, in who we bring on board. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Is there a is there one question that's like your favorite hiring question you always make sure to ask? It depends on how well <laughs> the interview's going. Okay. If the interview's not not going well, uh, I'll start to have some fun with it. Uh, <laughs> uh, couple of them. If you could switch place with anybody in the world, who would it be and why? And I, I might ask that if the interview's going well. Also, okay. uh, if you could have two two celebrity parents, if you invited me over for dinner, what would you cook me? Uh, how many cows live in Canada? Uh, again, it, it depends on which way 
uh, the interviews going, but I've, I've got some fun ones. Do you feel like you have a fun one that kind of catches people, but also gives you some insight into really who they are? Yeah, uh, so the, the question I think that, that is fun and gives me a little bit of insight is, uh, what song best describes your work ethic? Got it, uh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, what, was yours, what would yours be? That would take some thought. What song best describes my work ethic? And this is another one while you think about it because we're in a sales environment, right? So I want to know how, how, how quick can you shoot from the hip, right? So I'll just draw a circle. Yeah, then I have to know Then I have to know songs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's horrible. Horrible. I could see how that's a brutal one. Yeah. I don't have an answer for you. That's, Did I fail the interview? Yeah, well. Pretty close. We'll see what everybody else has to say about <laughs> you. It'd be easier just to throw out a genre. Yeah. Uh, like, it's definitely something hard and fast. Okay. Now I have to narrow it down from there. All right. Like it's not country, you know, it's not uh, R and B. It's more rock. Cool. Definitely that style. But yeah, my music, my musical side. You could pick a theme of like, oh well, who do you match better? What what celebrity person like? Oh, Elon Musk. That's a great one. I'd be him. You okay. Know? So if you could have two <laughs> celebrity parents, who would they be? Elon Musk would be pretty awesome. I think. You know, that's probably a double-edged sword. And then you gotta let um, him go single dad. Huh? You gotta let him go single dad. Well, he's been married a few times, so I'm assuming I got one of the moms, right? Like, <laughs> I gotta pick one of those. I think he's Female been married the same, to the same woman a couple times. Yeah, twice, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, best dad. Yeah, that would be that would be pretty entertaining. I've heard they have, those kids have had a pretty good life. Sure. Uh, jet sitting around, lots of great experiences um, for the mother. That's another tough one. I have to think about good female role models that you know I identify with. I guess as a guy, it's a little harder because you know you just kind of go. To I, can, I can tell you're failing the interview now. <laughs> huh? You're failing the interview now. Man, this is a tough interview. Yeah. No thinking allowed. You got to think on your feet for insights, right? It. You got it. So the evolution of sales. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned the SDR podcast earlier, and SDR, BDR to some extent, but SDR has become like a, a pretty common term. I don't think before, maybe five or ten years ago, you know, SDR wasn't really this career path. You couldn't really, it was like, it was, you're an entry level salesperson and you're trying to get to enterprise salesperson. So now with SDR and inside sales and everybody being distributed, lots more technology, how do you feel that the sales roles have evolved and where are they going? Yeah, absolutely. Well, well first, uh, SDR as a role, I, I would suggest anybody uh, who wants to get into either sales or marketing or even finance, go spend six months to a year in an SDR role. Uh, because it, it's a tough role and you learn a lot about business very quickly. Uh, as far as an evolution of, of sales, I think we've definitely seen a shift from outside sales to inside sales as a whole. And I think there's a couple reasons we see that. One, because of the technology stack that we have, we, we have the ability to, to hit a lot more people with a lot more information uh, by our side when we, when we do so. Uh, second, it's cheaper, all right? So we're not having to expense mileage or, or vehicle reimbursement or, or anything like that. And again, just from the sheer volume uh, of contacts that you can make, uh, I think we've seen, especially in the tech space, the only outside sales reps we see in, in, in SaaS now are the true BDRs. And I, I don't mean the SDR BDR, I mean like the high level right. biz dev guys. Everybody else, even to an enterprise level, who might be selling into major universities or major healthcare systems, that business is all done over the phone now. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Jeb Blunt earlier, and I know you know he's big on like looking at the calculation of outside and inside, and showing you know an outside person can only physically get to so many places a day, you know, on site, going and hit knocking doors or whatever it might be, or. Uh, only you know so many meetings can be taken a day. Whereas you look at the economics and the numbers of an inside salespeople salesperson, and they're just astronomically larger from a number of touch points. So and I think it goes back to like not only like you said is is it less expensive to have somebody not driving around, but in a lot of ways they're more efficient. Now that doesn't mean they can do all the same things and build the same relationships face to face the same way. So there's other opportunities I think for those enterprise people or outside sales reps. Um, but yeah, it definitely speaks to the efficiency of that team. Yeah, and uh, you, you mentioned uh, you might not be able to build the same relationships. It's, it's really how you leverage the tools that you have. There's, there's LinkedIn to help build yeah. some trust so you're not just 
you know, a, a telemarketer calling on the other side. Uh, there's, there's emails and uh, there's social media now. You can prove that you're a real person and you're not just a scam artist uh, before you, you make that phone call. You know, a lot of people back in the day, especially when I started my career 10 years ago, they didn't trust somebody on the phone. They're like, hey, you got to come out and see me. But we've seen the evolution of social media. We've seen LinkedIn, you know, turn into this monster platform to where you really can start to build trust and actually build authentic relationships with people in a virtual world. If you're not calling your ball and if you're not where you want to be, like, no, just if, go into that a little bit more. So when I came into uh, into this role uh, about two years ago, it was a couple months before Christmas, and I, I started thinking about what I could get for my team, and I was like, I want to get team shirts, as like cheesy and cliche as it is, uh, and we kind of come up with a mantra: if you're not balling, you're calling. And what that means is, uh, is if you're not where you want to be in life, then you better pick up the phone and, and make it happen. Got it. Balling from a money perspective. Yeah, if you're not right. balling, you're calling. <laughs> right, right. I like to clarify for some of our cool. viewers. Yeah. You know. Uh, any other t-shirts that you've done that like have that ethos that you want? No, no t-shirts, but I think the t-shirts kind of go in, into a lot of that ancillary stuff that we do outside of the office, whether it's, it's softball, uh, a lot of happy hours. Yeah. Uh, we try and do at least quarterly outings, if not monthly outings, to go play laser tag, go bowling, get out of the office. Do we just recently did paintball, yeah. um, which you know everybody loves a, a shot to shoot the boss with a paintball. <laughs> I wasn't excited when they voted on that, uh, but it, it's important that we we foster relationships inside and outside of the office. And whether it's a mantra in a T-shirt or a happy hour or a softball league, it's something that I think we do really well here at Payscape. Uh, and it's something that, that uh, leadership has made a priority uh, and the reps have made a priority and it's, it's been really awesome.